Laura is a member of Crowley and Flex Environmental and Energy Practice Group, and her environmental practice includes litigation, permitting, and compliance work, as well as surplus Superfund natural resource damage and Clean Water Act issues. In 2010, Laura received a Master of Law degree in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School. Laura received her Juris Doctorate degree in 2008 from the University of Michigan Law School, and she holds an Environmental Studies degree from Middlebury College. She is the Vice Chair of the State Bar of Montana's Natural Resource, Energy, and Environmental Law Section. Please welcome Laura. Good morning, and um, thank you very much for having me. It's my first time at the conference. I know it's been going on for a while, and um, look forward to um, coming back again next year. Um, so I'm going to speak today on the Clean Water Act and some recent um, decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court, and then ensuing um, rule uh, updates by um, EPA and also the Army Corps of Engineers that has led to a lot of litigation <laughs> by many states um, in the United States um, in terms of uh, the extent of waters of the United States and and where where we draw the line between wet and dry um, and just you know it's a practical application clearly has effects on mining projects um, permitting permitting delays um, so something that we all should be aware of and you should be aware of um, with your mining projects as they're developed. So this is just a small overview of the different sections of the Clean Water Act. Um, you may be familiar with some of them. Um, the 402 is the discharge permit when you have a direct discharge. Um, today I'm going to focus on 404, um, which is when you have dredge or fill material in, in a wetland, um, and the Army Corps, um, as well as, you know, EPA, states, tribes, um, all, all have some, some role in that, um, but primarily the, the federal agencies. Um, so I'm going to take a quick overview of the U.S. Supreme Court history um, over over the last several decades um, for trying to figure out the extent of waters of the U.S. and, and where um, wetlands fall into that is important. So starting back in 85, we have an important um, uh, decision in Riverside Bayview. Um, and here the court looks to um, adjacent wetlands and decides they're protected under the Clean Water Act. But it does not actually decide the scope of federal jurisdiction other than just looking spe specifically at adjacent wetlands and in that case directly adjacent to clearly navigable water. Um, and then in what's called Swank in 2001, um, the court basically said the Army Corps went too far um, with the migratory bird rule, which um, included w uh, federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act for isolated wetlands that provided um, bird habitat to migratory birds. And so they said, you know, that's that's too far. Um, and then we have the unfortunate decision in um, 2006 um, in Rapanos, and very unfortunately, there was no majority opinion here. Um, there was a split decision by the court, so there's no controlling test or rule. Um, we have Justice Kennedy coming up with a concurrence, um, which neither, it's, it's basically what he came up with, um, which adopts this significant nexus test, which if you worked in wetlands um, over the past 20 almost years is, you know, problematic because it's a multi-factored um, test, case by case, um, really allows a lot of very broad jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. Um, but Justice Scalia, who wrote for the plurality, um, also not the majority, but um, uh, several other of the justices agreed with him. He had a much narrower test, and that is actually the test that was recently adopted by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Sackett decision, which came out last year that I'm going to talk about further here. So just last May, so about a year ago, um, we had Sackett versus EPA. Um, this case is based in Idaho. Um, 
regarding uh, wetlands and whether they're jurisdictional um, for uh, residential um, home site development that was, um, you know, tenuously connected um, to um, waters there, um, navigable waters. Um, so here we have Alito uh, speaking for the majority um, in very, I think, clear terms, which is helpful to have a majority in clear terms. And he you know, said, this case is about nagging questions of the outer reaches of the Clean Water Act and the with the principal federal law um, in the United States for water pollution. Um, so here the court was unanimous, which is also you know, great to have clear and strong wording that the lower court had applied the wrong standard for waters of the United States or WOTUS based on adjacency to other jurisdictional waters, but the justices were split 5-4, five, 5 being the majority on the appropriate test. So here, um, the majority opinion endorsed what Scalia had written um, before in Rapanos that the um, WOTUS is limited to relatively permanent bodies of water connected to traditionally navigable waters. Um, unfortunately, I said clear. <laughs> you can already see relatively permanent is not a very clear definition. So um, this comes up later in the uh, rulemaking um, by the core and by EPA in terms of what that means. Um, so, um, to summarize, uh, the second majority, um, in its decision was looking to harmonize, um, the term of waters of the United States with section 404 G1 of the Clean Water Act, which was added in 77 authorizing states to apply to EPA to um, for approval to administer permits um, for certain types of discharge and uh, except for certain traditional navigable waters or including wetlands adjacent there too. Um, here in Sackett, the majority and Alito explained that because adjacent wetlands are included within waters of the United States, the term navigable waters could not include WOTUS and adjacent wetlands. But I think this is helpful. Um, adjacent, the only, only adjacent wetlands that qualify as, as waters of the United States in their own right um, are included um, under the clean water jurisdiction. Um, and another helpful uh, quote, Wetlands that are separate from traditional navigable waters cannot be considered part of WOTUS, even if they are located nearby. So there has to be um, a clear connection and not, um, there needs to be adjacency. Um, so Sackett majority established a relatively clear two-part test um, for deciding if a wetland is um, WOTUS and thus subject to regulation and permitting under 404 of the Clean Water Act. The new test significantly narrows the prior definition of WOTUS and as such it um, really limits the federal agency's administrative control and jurisdiction over wetlands, or it should, <laughs> um, which we'll get to later. Uh, application of the test uh, via the WOTUS rule has real world effects, um, as mentioned before, delays in mining projects and also possible substantial civil penalties as well as criminal prosecution. Um, so that is some of the concerns raised by the states in their litigation is um, some due process issues um, for very hefty civil penalties as well as criminal prosecution for landowners that are you know, moving dirt around or, you know, unaware that they actually own wetlands. Um, typically in mining projects, you're doing a lot more, more study with that, but, um, you know, there could also be uh, unintended um, um, work in an area that could, you know, raise substantial civil penalties as well as possibly criminal prosecution. So here's the new test. Um, a wetland is indistinguishable indistinguishable from WOTUS and thus subject to uh, Clean Water Act jurisdiction. 
when the adjacent body of water is relatively permanent um, and connected to a traditional interstate navigable water, i.e. WOTUS itself, and the wetland in question and the adjacent water shares a continuous surface connection that makes it difficult to determine where the water ends and the wetland begins. Second, um, expressly rejected the significant ne nexus test from the Kennedy concurrence and Rapanos. Uh, Sackett found that Congress must be uh, exceeding, use exceedingly clear language if it wishes to alter the balance between federal and state power and the power of government over private property. So really getting to the federalism argument that lies at the heart of a lot of the Clean Water Act issues is how much can the federal agency come into the purview of states in terms of um, protection of their um, land and water resources. Um, it's the Sackett decision is the second term in which the court has held that Congress is required to provide very clear authors um, to provide clear authorization to EPA, but had not done so. And this came up in the West Virginia case, the EPA um, in 2002. Um, so I think the, you know, the court is being much more strict in terms of, um, you know, the language that needs to be provided for um, administrative action, which I think is helpful. So now I'm going to transition more into um, rulemaking for WOTUS by um, EPA and Army Corps. Um, and there's um, several different versions of these regulations. It gets rather confusing, but the pre-2015 um, regulations are important because that's actually what's in effect in Montana and 24 other states um, based on the, the litigation that I'll talk um, to later. So that's why we're looking at um, the pre-2015 regulation um, and there's a fairly lengthy um, definition of, of what waters of the United States include both by the Army Corps and the EPA regulations and the Code of Federal Regulations with the sites there. Um, primarily, you know, the waters that are interstate waters or foreign commerce is key. Um, all interstate waters, including interstate wetlands. Um, and then uh, imp impoundments are important. Um, tributaries of waters, wetlands adjacent to waters. And there is a carve out for um, prior converted cropland, which is excluded from the rule. So after 2015 and before Sackett, we have three different <laughs> rules by different administrations defining WOTUS. So clearly back and forth between administrations. Um, the 2020 Navigable Water Protection Rule was the Trump administration rule, um, and that was a substantial departure from the prior versions of the rule because that looked only to um, the substantial connection and, and more um, in line. It didn't apply the significant nexus, but it didn't last long. Um, and we have the most recent rule, which is the 2023 rule um, that first came out in January of last year. Um, the rule included wetlands um, that had the continuous surface connection to relatively permanent water. So that at that point, second hadn't come out. So that was the Scalia um, plurality and Rapanos, and it added in. So it was both the wetlands with the significant nexus. So really, you know, ev everything was in the cart <laughs> with the um, original um, 2023 rule. And interestingly, you know, was really pushed out when the agencies knew <laughs> that the Supreme Court was going to had heard had you know heard arguments and was going to decide uh, on Sackett. So, so a real push by the, um, the Biden agencies. Um, so pretty much immediately uh, in a, um, that January rule was supposed to become effective in March of last year. So in February, before the rule became effective, 24 states, including Montana, sued the agencies, challenged implementation. They had a multiple legal claims um, in April, 
the rule was enjoined in, four, in 24 states, um, and that included um, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Idaho. Um, there's a separate federal court district um, challenge that was filed specifically by Texas and Idaho in Texas, um, as well as um, singularly by Kentucky in Kentucky. And um, injunctions were granted um, in those. So there's three three state cases, um, but they all got injunctions. So it's um, the the new 2023 rule original and as amended is currently enjoined in 27 states, so over half of the states. And in those states, the pre-2015 regulations are what's in effect. And so that's why I highlighted that earlier, because it's reaching back. Thanks. Um, after Sackett, um, we had an amended rule that was published in September, um, allegedly to conform the um, the earlier rule to sack it. Interestingly, it was um, effective immediately without any further notice or comment, which becomes an issue for the states um, in terms of the procedure in which it was adopted. Um, as I mentioned um, in the states that the rule is enjoined, um, EPA and Army Corps are supposed to interpret what is consistent with the pre-2015 regulatory regime and SACIT because the pre-2015 also so has, so I've gone over these for some clients and you have to, you have to look at the 20, um, pre-2015 but also apply SACIT. So only um, the um, narrower test applies and EPA has a actually fairly helpful um, information on its website about what that pre-2015 regulatory regime looks like. So here is a map showing in, I would say, purple, <laughs> where the um, pre-2015 regs are in place, and in green, um, the 2023 rule as amended. So the primary legal case um, currently reviewing the jurisdictional reach of the um, feds over wetlands remains um, the district court litigation, West Virginia, and all filed in North Dakota. Um, th there was a stay during um, Sackett decision that was lifted, um, so there's active litigation starting last fall. Um, states filed amended complaints in November of last year challenging the legality of the amended rule because originally they were only challenging the January rule. So they really have a ton of um, claims. I spent a lot of time reading over the filings. They're pretty interesting. Um, and I liked this quote that the rule illegally subjugates state sovereign interests to the desires of two federal agencies for remote, non-navigable, intermittent, and ephemeral and purely intrastate waters. Um, there's been a ton of inter um, interveners on both sides. There's a lot of national industry and trade groups, um, including um, some mining mining interests. Um, and then for the defendants, um, the, the, the feds, um, there's been Native American tribes as well as some NGOs in the Texas case that have intervened as def defendants. So um, a lot of parties, uh, active litigation, um, just, you know, very recently, uh, the states and business groups filed for summary judgment and the federal motions were just filed at the end of April. Um, plaintiffs raised multiple claims. Um, Notably, that the amended rule omits key requirements of the Sackett's controlling wetland adjacency test and illegally intrudes on state interests. Um, there, other claims include um, exceeding authority under the Clean Water Act and also the Administrative Procedure Act, um, where their jurisdiction should only be to navigable waters and WOTUS. There's claims of being um, the rule being unconstitutionally vague. Um, there's no um, definition of relatively permanent, uh, which is 
difficult <laughs> um, and violations of the U.S. Uh, Constitution in terms of um, the Commerce Clause and, as I mentioned, the due process more for, you know, not knowing, especially for um, uh, private landowners, that you're <laughs> violating something and could be subject to large civil and criminal um, penalties and fines. Um, and then the Tenth Amendment reserving um, rights to the states and also the recent um, major question doctrine um, that had been clarified um, previously by the court where you have to have a clear statement from Congress for agencies to enact a rule with major policy impacts on the U.S. economy, and clearly because this wetland, what is wet and dry affects so much, much land. Um, so let's see. And then the agencies basically are saying that the states lack standing um, because uh, they don't have, their injuries are speculative, um, they fail, fail to show specific harm, and it's not ripe for review. So um, stay tuned this summer. <laughs> um, and I'll go quickly because I just have five minutes. So um, I mentioned there is other claims in Texas. Um, the legal arguments uh, are, are very similar to the primary West Virginia case. Um, Kentucky, they're continuing to argue <laughs> about, um, you know, whether it was dismissed um, improperly. Um, and then there's a couple of recent cases I wanted to quickly cover um, by private citizen plaintiffs. So these aren't the states, these are just affected landowners. Um, so there was one that was just filed this past March in North Carolina, where the amended rule is in effect by a landowner challenging jurisdiction. And then there's another very interesting case um, in the Fifth Circuit out of Louisiana, where um, landowners had requested um, review under the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, the lower court's earlier decisions uh, in favor of the Army Corps' pre-Sackett findings under the significant nexus test that um, their properties, I think it was about 30% of their properties under the significant nexus test were wetlands, but ultimately the Fifth Court, Fifth um, Circuit applying um, Sackett said there was no wetlands. So that's a pretty big deal. This is the white VEPA. This is the North Carolina case that just got um, filed. And this is the Lewis v. U.S. This is the Fifth Circuit case that was just decided in December um, that found there was no wetlands under Sackett's clear controlling test. And the, the plaintiffs um, had gone um, through a lot, 10 years of, of litigation um, in the district court over um, uh, administrative um, jurisdictional determinations by the core, uh, and then basically the the appeals court said there's been so much back and forth that remand was not appropriate. Um, they noted that the Lewis was caught in the coils of the Army Corps' assertions of jurisdiction for almost 10 years over the properties, and enough was enough, which I liked. <laughs> Um, and then they only looked to Sackett's test to find no wetlands. So, I mean, fortunately, there is some clarity from Sackett, unfortunately, um, with what the agencies are doing, in my opinion, with the rule, doesn't follow Sackett and doesn't provide enough clarity. Um, and hopefully um, the states will come out and the courts will come out with some better clarity looking to sack it um, as the Fifth Circuit did in Lewis. Um, so my summary and parting thoughts are um, that Sackett did settle some of the, the waters of the U.S. jurisdiction issues, um, but the current um, litigation continues and will likely continue for many years. Hopefully we'll get some answers out of the courts um, for better clarity. Obviously, um, the rules are going to change with the administration and the upcoming election, depending on the outcome. Um, so the takeaway uh, that I, I have is just to be um, careful and pay attention to what rule is in effect in the um, specific states that you're working in and, and monitor the litigation for those states for further development.
with that, I'll, if there's any time for questions, I'll be happy. We have time for a couple questions. I have two big ones for you. Okay, I'll try. What happened to the massive amount of inventory that had been done in the past, for example, the National Wetland Inventory? And what about wetland accounting, where for a project you might have to equal the functionally effective wetland after the project that was there before the wetland, and now it might not even be a wetland. <laughs> it, it, it is difficult. Um, one of the projects I've been recently working on in Montana, um, there's a lot of jurisdictional determinations previously from prior development that didn't go forward. Um, and, um, you know, we can't really look back to um, those because they were done under the significant nexus test. Um, in terms of wetlands and the inventory, and I think there's a difference between a scientific determination of a wetland in terms of, you know, the hydro and the vegetation and the water um, versus, you know, what would be jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. <laughs> you can still have a wetland, but it's not necessarily a jurisdictional wetland. So, um, you know, in some states I practiced in Massachusetts and we had multiple layers of local <laughs> wetland rules and state wetland rules and um, also um, the federal rules. And so, for example, I'm in the Bozeman office and the city of Bozeman is one of the few <laughs> um, municipalities in Montana that have um, local wetland rules. And so those on the national wetland inventory could still be, you know, what they're, they're wetlands. It's just a question of whether um, they're jurisdictional under the Clean Water Act. Does that answer your question? Not exactly. So, all the counties can get jurisdictional wetlands, and jurisdictional wetlands are used for wetland accounting, too. So, it's not, just a, it's not just a question of somebody's subjective idea. I'm talking about jurisdictional wetlands. Yeah, I think and, that would have to be mass inventory, millions and millions of acres in Alaska, all this work that's been done. Yep. They just say that's no good now. I don't think it's no good, but I think, you know, with the different test and the narrower test, it's going to be a lot less wetlands um, that are jurisdictional. And, and that was um, part of the why this second decision was a big deal. It's because it takes out a lot of wetlands that were jurisdictional. So, yes, I think that data, you know, will have to be reviewed and on a, you know, case by case basis. So, unfortunately, it, it, it would impact that. I have a two-part question. Um, I actually went looking for recent uh, AJD uh, documents on Montana's regulatory page. They were unavailable, dead links. Have you seen a change, uh, a fundamental change in AJDs uh, since the, the pre-2015 through SACIT rule has been put in place? And on top of that, is NEPA process a backdoor uh, for claiming impacts to what would be non-jurisdictional wetlands? and therefore having to potentially compensate or, you know, not through the Army Corps process, but offset impacts through the NEPA process as mitigation, you know, not under the core rule, but under some other type of way to address the NEPA process. Sure. Um, I know for the jurisdictional determinations, they are very slow. Um, there's a project I've been working on for the last year, and, um, you know, it took I mean, they're very slow in the first place, and I think they've gotten slower. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, there's not a lot of direction um, from the regional offices for um, the Army Corps in terms of direction and timing. And, um, you know, it is, in my opinion, seeming like a bit of a, a black hole um, from my project experience. Um, and then I guess with the NEPA question, um, I don't, I don't have a direct answer on that, but it seems like a, a potential option, but I, I can't speak to that. Time for one more question. Any last question? Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Laura.